program created by the Rio Grande Oil Company. Los Angeles Police calling all cars, attention all cars, attention all Los Angeles County Sheriff's cars, broadcast 147, a murder in the Viduga Hills outside Glendale. That's all. Rolls and quit. suddenly decide to try Rio Grande cracked gasoline, every Rio Grande service station tank would be dry in a few hours. Every week we appeal to all of you to drive into a Rio Grande station, and after every broadcast, hundreds accept our invitation. You look for the big Rio Grande sign, you see the slogan, calling all cars, cracks gasoline, and you drive in. If you've followed our broadcasts, Carefully, you ask for a free copy of the Calling All Cars News and look for the illustrations of the 14 free gifts Rio Grande offers to boys and girls. Then you say, skeptically, to the attendant, Well, fill her up with Rio Grande cracks. I've heard so much about it, I want to see how it's true. So, you get a tank full. And you get a handful of police money with your change. Police money that youngsters are eagerly saving to exchange for Rio Grande's free gifts. And you start down the street expecting great things to happen. Ah, but nothing does. Well, remember, you've got at least a gallon or so of some other gasoline to use up. Perhaps you won't notice the difference until next morning when you step on the starter and find your engine roaring before you can get your foot off the button. You never had starts like that with any other gasoline. Get into second gear, speed up, and you can't help but notice how much peppier your car acts. How easily you pass other cars in traffic can speed ahead after traffic stops. Look for a hill. Go up it in high gear. You'll agree then that Rio Grande Crack makes all the difference in the world in your car, and you'll realize then what we mean when we offer you police car performance in your car. And now it is our pleasure to present Sheriff Eugene Biscalouse of Los Angeles County. Sheriff Biscalouse. Good evening, friends. If an individual contemplating a crime no matter for what motive, greed, or revenge, or whatever, could know what is common knowledge to every law enforcement officer, we would have no crime problem. The lawbreaker in his ego thinks he can pit his intelligence against the combined criminal experience of a host of officers. Such a man hasn't enough intelligence. If he had, he wouldn't try to get away with it. Even the most daring gambler would hesitate to play against the odds which confront the lawbreaker. It is my hope, and I am sure the hope of other participating officers, that this radio broadcast has in some measure, during the nearly three years it has been on the air, served to convince the public of the futility of crime. You can't continue to get away with it. June 21st, 1913. Spring has come late, and the wildflowers are still blooming in the green Verdugo Hills of Love Glendale. Along a deserted path which branches up into the hills from the end of the car line, walk a carpenter and a woman companion seeking the late blooming poppies in Larkspur. Oh, Don, it's so lovely up here. It sure is, Bertie. Look at that patch of poppies down there by that pool. Gosh, just like a golden carpet. Let's go down there. All right. Only, Sarah, will you kiss me first? Now, Don, don't be silly. Uh, Sarah. Listen, what's that? Sounds like somebody moaning. It, it came from in those bushes there. I'll take a look. The woman, all covered with blood. <gasps> here, Sarah, help me pull her out of here. She's trying to speak. Oh, her tongue's too swollen. Her throat's cut. Oh, horrible. Listen, Sarah, we got to get her to a doctor quick. Oh, we can't carry her. No, but I have it. I'll go down the trail to the nearest phone. You stay here with her. What will I do? I, I'm frightened. Now, don't go to pieces. Get her some water. See if she'll drink. Oh, Don, don't leave me. I've got to. You take care of her. I'll be back just as soon as I can. <laughs> Deputy sheriffs arrive at the scene almost as quickly as the doctor, who has grave news for them. Well, doctor, 
What is it? Yeah, it's bad, Sweezy. She was dead when I got here. But she was alive when you found her. Yes, sir. She was moaning, trying to tell us something. She died a few minutes after you left, John. At least she didn't moan anymore. It was terrible. Worse even than a moaning. Oh. Perhaps you don't think there are many others. That is, if you're through questioning us, we think. Sure, go ahead. Take her home. She's all upset. Thank you. Come along, Sarah. Now, what have you found, Doctor? Well, her skull has been fractured by a blunt object. Her throat's been cut. Either injury could have caused death. Well, another strange thing, her hair smells of beer. Smells of beer, huh? Mm -hmm. Well, here's the answer to this one. Look, Sweezy, the broken half of the beer bottle and some bloody stained bits. Well, looks as though he broke the bottle over her head and then cut her throat with a jagged end. Hmm, nice fellow. Yeah. Anything else, Moody? Well, a man's footprints lead from the place where the body was found to that pool down there. Toe prints are dug in there as though he'd stooped to wash his hands. Then the tracks disappear in the brush. That fellow who found the body said something about meeting a man as he came up the trail, didn't he? Yeah. Described him as middle-aged, stockily built, and in a hurry. Mm-hmm. Well, you boys spread around the neighborhood at the foot of the trail and see if you can find anybody down there who saw this man. And, uh, Doctor, you better get the body into the morgue so we can go over the clothes for identification. A squad of deputies comb the neighborhood at the end of Brand Avenue car line. Finally succeed in discovering a woman who says... Why, yes. I saw a couple go up at the trail about two o'clock. I was sitting outside on my porch. And what did they look like, ma'am? Well, the man was short and sort of stocky and middle-aged. The woman was a little younger, fat, and her hair was going gray. They were arguing. Did you see them when they came back down the trail? No. Well, that is not the woman. Just saw the man coming back. When was that? Oh, about an hour later. <laughs> Armed with this meager information, Deputy Moody reports to Deputy Sweezy at headquarters. Not much to go on. That's a fact, but it will help. What did you discover? Nothing much more. No identification on the clothing, excepting that the underwear was bought at the Los Angeles department store. There was a hole in the shirt waist that might indicate a pin or something been torn off it. And there's a white line on the ring finger of the left hand that might indicate the victim had worn a wedding ring recently. Well... That department store label in the underwear bears out a hunch of mine. What's that? That the victim and the murderer are from Los Angeles. How do you figure that? Glendale and Pasadena are both dry. They had beer with them. They must have bought it in L.A. Well, I think you're right about that, but Los Angeles is a pretty big town. We've got a devil of a job to identify her. We'll have to get a lot of publicity from the papers. And then when people start coming in to try to identify her, we'll have a department store dummy dressed in her clothes and see if they can identify her. Good idea. We'll get the papers to spread the thing tomorrow morning. For three days, a throng of people flock to the morgue, view the mysterious body, investigate the ghoulish display of the model dressed in the dead woman's clothes, are unable to identify her. Then, on the Wednesday following the murder, the city editor of the Los Angeles Herald summons a young reporter, Jimmy Pope, now Judge Pope for the municipal court, to his desk. Tells him to go out with the deputies investigating the crime and stick with them till they get the story. Young Pope, thrilled with the prospect of a big story, rushes out to the murder hill, joins the officers. It is a hot day, and after several hours of fruitless attempts to find something to write about, Jimmy decides to sprawl out in some tall grass and take it easy. But just as he sits down, he sees a young boy stoop over, pick up something from the ground, examine it intently. His curiosity aroused, he calls to him. Hey, young fellow, what you got there? These papers? Come on over and let me look, will you? What for? Oh, I don't know. Just want to look at it, that's all. What do you want to look at it for, huh? Say, you're certainly full of questions for a young one, aren't you? Come on, let's see what you've got. I won't hurt it. How much will you give me if I do? How much will I give you? Say, what is this, a racket? Will you give me a nickel? I should say not. A nickel for a piece of paper? Come on now, be a good sport and let me see it. Sure, for a nickel. No. Hey, hey, where are you going? Home. All right, Jesse James. Come here. Here. Hmm? Here's a nickel for your precious piece of paper. Oh, boy. Hey, it's a brand new one, too, ain't it, huh? Sure, nothing but the best. Now give me the paper. Sure, here you are. <laughs> a bit of black paper from a Kodak film. Say... Mister, what do you want that piece of paper so bad for, huh? Oh, you've got me there, young fellow. I couldn't tell you. But there's one thing certain. Now that I've paid a nickel for it, I'm sure going to hang on to it. During the rest of the long afternoon, young Pope occupies himself with one thing and another. 
picks up some scraps of white paper from under a bush, sticks them in his pocket for luck, and at last, just at sundown, the deputy sheriffs give him a ride back to town. Weary from the long day, he finds sleep impossible when he arrives home. So to keep his mind occupied, he mulls over the black Kodak paper, examines the scraps of white paper minutely. And the next morning, he presents himself to the city editor with no story, but a meager lead to one. What did you get out there yesterday, Jim? Well, I don't know if it's worth anything, boss, but here it is. A piece of black paper off a roll of film and some scraps of white paper. I fitted the scraps together and pasted them on a piece of cardboard last night. And here's the result. Seems to be a receipt. Oh, received of Mr. Larson, $50 deposit. Signed, S. Hickson. Have you followed up on this, Hickson? Yes, sir. I've checked with the city directory. There's an S. Hickson that runs a saloon at 112 East 1st Street. Better go ride down there and see what he knows about this. And I'll send Fitzgerald over to the morgue to ask everyone who abuse that body whether they know a Mr. or Mrs. Lars. While Fitzgerald races off to the morgue on the city editor's hunch, Jim Pope heads for the saloon on 1st Street. Good morning, sir. Good morning. What are you? Are you Mr. Hickson, the proprietor? Yes. I've got a receipt here I found. I wonder if you could tell me who this Mr. Larson is. Uh, I don't know. You signed this receipt, didn't you? Nope. That's not your signature? Nope. You must be mistaken, young man. I don't know any Mr. Larson, and I didn't sign that slip. While Pope crushed reports his failure to the editor... Fitzgerald and the deputy sheriffs interviewed nearly 40 people who call at the morgue to view the body of the murder victim. Finally, a woman who stands looking at the clothed dummy in the outer office volunteers the first important bit of information. Some of those clothes look familiar. Do you happen to know a Mrs. Larson? Yes. What makes you ask? It might have a bearing on this case. Do you know where Mrs. Larson is now? Why, she went to San Francisco on Sunday. On Sunday? Yes, she left suddenly. Will you step in here, please? Uh, pull the sheet off this one, will you, Steve? Okay. Recognize that body, ma'am? Yes. Mrs. Larson. Sure? Yes, yes, of course. I'm positive it's her. Okay, Steve, thanks. Come this way, ma'am. Now, sit down right here, will you, please? I want to ask you some questions. All right. But what could have happened to her? Who did it? That's what I want to know. That's just what we're trying to find out, ma'am. Now, what's your name? This is Mary Garsweiler. Address? 1129 South Olive Street. And how long have you known Mrs. Larson? For years. Where did she live? Over on West Seco. Number 12, 2 and 3 quarters. Did she live alone? No. She lived with her husband and her daughter. I see. Well, thanks, Mrs. Garsweiler. We'll get in touch with you when we need you. Acting upon the new bit of information, Deputy Sweezy and reporter Fitzgerald rushed to the Larson home on Pico Street. Not knowing exactly what to expect, the two men approached the house cautiously, ready for any surprise move the suspected Larson might make. But in response to Sweezy's knock, the door swings open. A young girl peers at them a brief instant, then slams the door shut again. Huh. That's a fine reception committee. What do you suppose made her do that? We'll find out soon enough. Maybe she thinks we're bill collectors. Then again, maybe she's been told not to open the door to strangers. Well, what do you want? Are you Miss Larson? Yes. Is your daddy here? Well, what do you want? Just want to talk to him, that's all. Well... He's not here, and I'm sorry, but I'll have to shut the door. Are you here all alone? Well, I don't see why you want to know. Better tell her who we are, Swizzy. The kid's scared of something. Seems that way, all right. Now, uh, look, miss. I'm Deputy Sheriff Swizzy, and this gentleman's a reporter. We're not going to hurt you. Just want to ask your father if he's listening. Well, I thought maybe... Maybe we were going to rob the house. Mommy told me not to talk to any strangers. He was away. <laughs> well, you don't have to be afraid of us, young lady. We are not here to harm anybody. You say your mother's away? Yes, sir. Daddy said she'd gone to San Francisco. Now, where is your daddy? Working? Yes, sir. I hate to have to do this, Fitz, but we need a positive identification. You mean take this kid down? Exactly. To... If it's her mother, she's got to know sooner or later anyway. Yeah, I suppose you're right. You're talking about my mother. 
Something's happened now, to Now, wait a minute, young lady. We what? didn't say that anything had happened to her. We just... You did. You did. You said I'd have to know about something anyway. Where is she? <laughs> Where is she? Where is even worse than I'd figured, but it's got to be done. <laughs> Taken to the morgue, the sob-wracked child stands clutching Deputy Sweetie's hand, looks for one instant at the body, then runs screaming out of the dismal place. Identification of the murdered woman is complete. A short time later, the grief-stricken child tells the two men a tearful story. Daddy and Mother left home together last Sunday about noon. They said they were going house hunting. Late that night, Daddy came back alone. He said Mother suddenly made up her mind to go to San Francisco. He said, he said we'd follow her in a few weeks as soon as she found a house up there. And where is your daddy now? He's at work. He works at a barber shop. Well, uh, where is the barber shop? At 110 East First Street. 110 East First. <laughs> Next door to Hickson Saloon. Having completed their investigation and gotten a scoop onto the press, reporters Fitzgerald and Pope accompanied Deputy Sweezy to the barber shop on First Street. Just have a seat, gentlemen. Just be one minute. We're looking for a man named Larson. Does he work here? Uh, sure, that's him. Back at the last chair, he's shaving that policeman. Thanks. Murderer shaves policeman the sheriff's clothes in. What a headline, eh, Fitz? Don't be so bloodthirsty. They haven't proven a case against him yet. But they will. Uh, your name Larson? Yes. Sorry to have to bring you bad news, Larson. But your wife's been murdered. What? Yeah. Just got an identification on that Verduga Hills murder. The victim is your wife. Well, there must be some mistake. My wife's in San Francisco. I put her on the one o'clock train myself. Well, there must be some mistake. There's no mistake. Your daughter's already identified the body. You better come along with us to headquarters. We want to ask you some questions. While Barbara Larson is stepping out of his white coat, reporter Pope ducks into the saloon next door and tells bartender Hickson the developments. Now, what I want to know is, what's the big idea of the runaround? Larson is a barber next door, and it stands to reason you know him. And that receipt I showed you is signed by him. Chances are he's guilty of the murder of his wife and will be hung for it. Now, why hold out on me? Well, I tell you, son. It's my business. I make it a policy never to know too much about the other fellow's affair. And never to talk about what I do know. Well, that's a very worthy policy, but when you're handling murder, it pays to tell all you know. I haven't got anything to hide. I signed that receipt, all right. You see, Larson's foreman of the shop next door, and on Saturday nights, he's always left in charge. He brings the cash in here when he closes up to keep in my safe over Sunday, and I give him a receipt for it. Then on Monday, he returns the receipt, and I give him the money, which he deposits in the bank. One night, he was in a hurry. He didn't wait for the receipt. I made it out anyway, and I put it with the money. He found it when he took the cash to the bank on Monday... And he intended to give it back to me, but he forgot about it. Later, he told me he destroyed it. So what do you think? Did he kill his wife? I don't know. He was awfully stuck on some girl that wasn't his wife. I know that. That's motive enough. Thanks for coming clean, Mr. Hickson. I'll come back someday and buy you a drink. Hope joins the officers in the barbershop and tells them for the first time about the receipt and the story he has just learned from Hickson about the other woman. The officers immediately begin to search Larson's locker. Well, here's one thing that may check. A wedding ring. Yeah, and what's that? It's one of those, uh, what do you call it, watches? Chatelaine. Yeah, that's it, Chatelaine. It kind of pins to his shirtwaist. He must have ripped that off her. Remember, the doctor said the shirtwaist looked as though a pin had been torn out? Yeah. I'll bet this is what she was wearing. Yeah, and look here. A picture of a girl in a nurse's uniform. With her name written across the bottom. Lulu Maud Carpenter. <laughs> Not bad looking, is she, sweetie? Hey, wait a minute. What's up? Look, this roll of film here. Well, what about it? If I'm not mistaken, it fits this roll of black paper I got from the kid on the hill. My boy, you ought to be a detective. Why, I'm ashamed enough of myself as it is, being a newspaper man. While officers are searching for the mysterious Lulu, Maud Carpenter, Moody and Sweetie question Lawson. We found some things in your locker down at the barber shop we'd like to ask you about, Mr. Larson. All right. Go ahead. This watch. Where did you get it? 
I bought it years ago in San Francisco. How about this ring? Well, I bought that from a peddler on Main Street. Where's your wife, Mr. Larson? I told you I put her on the one o'clock train to San Francisco on Sunday. You viewed the corpse in the morgue? Yes. And you deny it's the body of your wife? Well, I can't be sure. I, I don't think it is. Mr. Larson, you know very well it is. Now, why don't you stop lying to us and make it easy on yourself? I'm not lying. I'm trying to help you. Listen, Larson. You say you put your wife on the one o'clock train to San Francisco Sunday. That's right. There is no one o'clock train that leaves to San Francisco on Sunday or any other day. You claim you bought this watch years ago? This watch belonged to your wife. Your daughter's identified it. You tore it off your wife's body after you murdered her with a beer bottle. You say you bought this wedding ring from a peddler on Main Street. Your daughter identifies it as belonging to your wife. It fits your wife's finger perfectly. You killed your wife, didn't you? You killed your wife because you were in love with Lula Maud Carpenter, didn't you? Well? I have nothing to say. In the face of Larson's bland refusal to talk, the investigation grinds on. Little bit by little bit, the evidence piles against Larson. A conductor on the Glendale line of the Pacific Electric says... Yes, I saw this man on Sunday. He got on my car about one o'clock down at six in Maine and rode to the end of the line. He carried a bundle that might have contained bottles of beer. And from a bartender across the street, from the barber shop on First Street... Yes, I know, Larson. I sold him two bottles of beer on Saturday night. Then the word comes that the officers have located Miss Carpenter and are bringing her in. While Moody and Sweezy are waiting for her, the developed roll of film is delivered to them. Well, let's see what Mr. Larson's been photographing. Hmm. Pictures of our friend Miss Carpenter. Would you look here, Moody? These pictures were taken by that pool up in the hill. Sure, that's where young Pope got that black paper. Yeah. But can you imagine a fellow like that? Takes his girl up in the hills one weekend and comes back the next weekend and murders his wife in the same spot. <laughs> he likes the place. Maybe he'll buy a lot up there. Boys, we've got Miss Carpenter outside, sir. Send her in. Yes, sir. Will you come in, miss? Thank you. Uh, sit down, please, Miss Carpenter. Thank you. I'm Deputy Sheriff Sweezy. This is Deputy Sheriff Moody. How do you do? Uh, Miss Carpenter, are you acquainted with Mr. Larson? Why, yes. The officers told me what you suspect him of. I, I just can't believe it. He was always so kind and good to me. Mm-hmm. Now, do you mind telling us, ma'am, all you know about him? Well, I first met him last December when he came to my aunt's house to inquire about some real estate she was selling. He posed as a wealthy investor. Said he was single and lived at a downtown hotel. We became good friends after a while. He was very religious. Every Sunday... We went to church together. Do you recognize these pictures, Miss Carpenter? Oh, oh, yes. Yes, of course. They were taken by Mr. Larson when we went to pick wildflowers. Oh, uh, when was that? Two weeks ago, last Sunday. And last Sunday, he took his wife to the same place where these pictures were taken and beat her over the head with a beer bottle. Oh, please don't. Uh, did you notice Mr. Larson throw anything away while you were up there with him? Uh, any piece of paper, that is? Why, yes, I did. He put his hand in his pocket for something or other and took out a piece of paper instead. He didn't seem to want me to see it, so he crumpled it up and threw it away. I shouldn't think he'd want you to see it. Here it is. A receipt for Saturday's take at the barber shop. He wouldn't want to admit that to you when he was posing as a rich real estate operator. No. No, I can see that now. Now, when did you see him last? On Sunday evening. Just after he murdered his wife. Yes, I guess so. Uh, what did you do that night? I met him about six o'clock at the P.E. station at 6th and Main. We had dinner at a cafeteria. Then we went to church. After services, we had a dish of ice cream. And then he took me to the hospital where I was due on duty at 10 o'clock. Did he act nervous or upset? Yes, he did. He was very strange. He kissed me goodnight, but well, not in the way he usually did. I said I was afraid he didn't love me anymore, and he made a strange remark. I, I guess I'm just beginning to understand it. What did he say? He said, I think enough of you to make it possible for you to be my wife.
damning statement, the evidence assembled by the officers and the two newspaper reporters, need only a second and even more damning statement to convict Larson of the murder of his wife. That statement is made by Larson's daughter on the witness stand. My mother told me once that if anything ever happened that she was hurt or killed, I mustn't let my father go free. Larson could bring no defense to sway a jury away from the evidence of his guilt, furnish by Deputy Sheriffs Moody and Sweezy, and reporters Jimmy Pope and Fitzgerald. He was found guilty of murder in the first degree, and in due time was hanged in San Quentin Penitentiary. Thank you, Sheriff Fiskaloos. Sheriffs and police chiefs of California, Arizona, and Nevada unanimously agree that calling all cars helps prevent crime, and that Rio Grande cracked gasoline helps catch criminals. Sheriffs of many western counties specify Rio Grande cracked as do the police chiefs of Los Angeles, Oakland, and other leading western cities. These men give gasoline its supreme test, and they know that Rio Grande crack starts quicker, goes faster, and further. As a result of their recommendation, Rio Grande cracked gasoline powers more police and emergency cars than any other brand everywhere it is sold. You can get this same gasoline in your neighborhood Rio Grande station. But if you are going to enjoy police car performance in your own car... First, protect your engine with Sinclair motor oil. Many oils break down at high speed. Many oils fail to lubricate fast starting engines. But we guarantee that Sinclair motor oil will never fail to give your engine perfect lubrication. The impurities have been extracted, the wax, the petroleum jelly, that weakens motor oils, leaving only pure concentrated oil. Every Rio Grande dealer recommends and guarantees Sinclair motor oil. All cars, attention all cars, attention all Los Angeles County Sheriff's cars. A cancellation broadcast 147 regarding a murder. Suspect in this case now in custody. That's all. No Frederick Lindsley bidding you good night for the Rio Grande Oil Company. <laughs> <laughs>